butt fifth of the 737 MAX 9. How many people have been following that story? How many people would fly on a MAX 9 right now? I would, on one condition, if it was properly inspected. So let me tell you a story. And if you've been watching me on the news, you know I've been talking about this a lot. In fact, I've been talking about this since 1979, and the FAA has done nothing. Guess what? McDonnell Douglas, Lockheed, oh, some of you are old enough to remember Convair, and of course Boeing. You know, when they used to make their airplanes, they would put the prototype on a test bed and take every component part to failure. They don't do that anymore. They get them certified on computer. Anybody have a problem with that? Number two, they use what they call FAA designated inspectors. We learned about this, most of you did, I've been yelling about it since 1979, but we learned about this when we had the two MAX crashes a couple of years ago in Indonesia and Ethiopia, where 346 people died. And what did we learn? That Boeing was allowed by the FAA to self-certify their planes as airworthy. Does that not scream out conflict of interest? But it gets worse because they use somebody they call FAA designated inspectors. These are the folks who are supposed to inspect every plane as it comes down the assembly line and then say it's safe. FAA designated inspectors at Boeing are on the payroll of Boeing. Anybody have a problem with that? You should. If I made that chair and I certified it as safe and told you to sit in it, don't sit in it. Not a good idea. I wouldn't know what I was doing. But let's get serious here. I'll start with some good news. We've just celebrated the 30 safest years in commercial aviation safety since commercial aviation began. That's great, right? We've only had, yeah, you can applaud. Look, there have only been three fatal accidents in this country since 2001. Think about that. There are 45,000 planes in the air today over the United States and nothing happened. And nothing happened yesterday. Nothing's going to happen tomorrow. The odds are overwhelmingly in your favor. The three accidents, for those of you who remember, two of them happened in New York. One was Rockaway, November 11th, 2001, the American Airlines plane going to the Dominican Republic where the tail fell off. Another story. The second was up in Buffalo in uh, 2009, uh, Colgan Air. And the third was in Lexington, Kentucky, when the pilots went down the wrong runway. That's it. How amazing is that, right? All right, so the question is, we can't really improve that batting average. It's so good. The real challenge is, can we maintain it? And right now, I'd have to tell you, probably not. Because the FAA is not doing its job. When the FAA was started by an act of Congress back in 1935, it was given a dual mandate an impossible dual mandate. The first part of it we all support, to enact and enforce airline safety. We, we all appreciate that. What was the second mandate? To promote the business of aviation. Can't do both. And every time the FAA has been confronted with a safety problem as well as a safety solution, you know what they did? They either slow walked it or they actually worked on the side of the economic impact to the manufacturer or the operator. This is wrong. That's not their job. Boeing is not the FAA's client. You are. And that's what we're seeing now with the 737 MAX 9. Because when the National Transportation Safety Board investigated this, and by the way, they're not calling it an incident, they're calling it an accident when that door panel blew out at 16,000 feet over Oregon. And luckily, very luckily, it happened at 16,000 feet and not at 35,000 feet. The pilots were able to turn around and make an emergency landing back in Portland and nobody died and nobody was injured. They lost a few cell phones. How about that fun story? There's an ad for Apple you never could back up. Anybody remember that story? They found the cell phone on the ground and, and, and not only was it working, it had a text message there from Alaskan Airlines to the passenger about his bags. <laughs> you can't make that up. Anyway, here's the story. The NTSB does great work. They're the heroes here. And their job is to do what? Determine the probable cause of that accident. But they go beyond that. They also suggest the solutions. So what have they been able to do? In any accident investigation, you have to painstakingly rule everything out before you can rule anything in. So what have they been able to rule out? This is all good news. 
They ruled out that it was a design flaw. It's not, right? They ruled out it was materials. It wasn't. They ruled out it was structural. It wasn't. What did they rule in? Manufacturing, installation, oversight, and inspection. So why do you think they halted the production line at Boeing two days ago? Because there's nobody to inspect who doesn't work for Boeing. Whoops. That's what we have to figure out now. We'll be having hearings on Capitol Hill this week, starting on Monday. And one of the things that should come out of that is funding the FAA with enough resources, staff, and money to be able to hire the independent third-party investigators and inspectors that the FAA should have had all along. So, would I go flying on a 737 MAX 9 today? Yes, because if it's flying today, it has been properly inspected. But it doesn't deal with the long-term issue of who is watching the store. So I want you to think about that because you'll be impacted on it if you haven't already, if you've been flying Alaskan Airlines or United Airlines. They had 171 planes that were grounded that are now coming in back into the air starting yesterday, today, tomorrow, and for the next two weeks. Now, having said that, you know what? We have other issues to talk about. And that is how much you're gonna pay for your airfare. How many people here tried to go to Europe last summer? You know what the average airfare was, coach, from New York to London in August of last summer? $2,100. You know what it is today? If you do it right, 407. You can do it. But what's gonna happen this summer? We have the Olympics in Paris. How many people are going to Paris for the Olympics? You have my condolences. Every airfare has been tripled. Even the, the Metro in Paris doubled their fares. They even doubled the, the entrance fee to the Louvre. Is it really a good idea to stand in line for three hours in front of that museum to go inside and come back an hour later and say, it's so small. How many people did that? Come on, you did it. I know you did. I'm not telling you not to go to the Louvre. I'm telling you not to go there this summer, right? Now, if you desperately need to go to Paris this summer, and assuming you have tickets for the Olympics, did you get tickets? No? Yes, okay. So if you have tickets, you still have to do something special. Hotel rates are out of control. They're getting two and $3,000 a night, right? So what you do is you, you fly on what we call an open jaw ticket. Fly to London, then take the train, and they get a day trip, and then take the train back to London. And then when you're ready to go home, I'm assuming you're going to one, more than one event, take the train back to Paris, do the event, and fly home. And when you do that, you're not, going to, not just gonna save money on your airline ticket, you're gonna save money on these draconian user taxes that most of you don't know about that appear in the United Kingdom. The UK has a tax which benefits nobody other than their general fund that says anybody who leaves from a UK airport has to pay that tax. So as long as you don't leave from the UK airport, flying there's fine, but as long as you don't leave from there, and let me tell you how much that tax is. The tax is based on the highest retail cost of whatever class of ticket you bought. So at a $2,100 coach ticket, that tax is almost $450, right? That's money you're not gonna get or keep. For $450 that you save, that's a hotel room near the airport in Paris, a great meal, or the train ticket for getting that. But now, let's take a look at fares in general. This summer, airfares are expected to go up 10% on international routes. Okay, that's not good news. Would you like some good news? That was unenthusiastic. Would you like some good news? Thank you. Domestic airfares are gonna drop between 14 and 18%. You know why? Because still people are traveling over their bucket list. They can't wait to go back overseas. Domestic destinations are going to have vacancies. They're going to have a space. And that's good news. And the same thing applies to the cruise industry. How many people here like cruises? How many people have been on more than one? Then you like them. Okay. Well, here's a little news bulletin. During the pandemic, even though the cruise lines were shut down for almost a year by the Centers for Disease Control, to be able to get their act together, by the way, which they did, they came out of the pandemic in two very good ways. One, their protocols have changed dramatically to benefit you in terms of, remember the words, social distancing. Also in terms of food service, hygiene, cleanliness, and other protocols. 
And the one business that was not idle during the pandemic was the shipyards. They were producing ships of every size and pedigree. And so now we're seeing all these new ships coming online with cabins they need to fill. That's good news for you. It's a buyer's market. And depending on what kind of ship you want, you could go for the huge ships. You may have seen the latest ship from Royal Caribbean, the icon of the seas, the largest cruise ship ever built. If you add up the number of passengers to the number of crew, you're over 10,000 people on that ship. Now, I got a little bit in trouble one day on CBS News when I said some of these ships are so large they have a high crime area on board. It was a joke, but it is a small city. Now, to Royal Caribbean's credit, they figured this out with naval architects and engineers and people who understand space and flow and movement. Uh, I've had a number of conversations with people who just went on that ship for the first time. You don't feel crowded. I, I used to fear that if I was on a ship with 10,000 other people, by the time I got off the ship, it would be time to get back on. Well, no, they figured out flow and movement and people really enjoy it. But they did something else when they built that ship. And I'm gonna say present company excluded, okay? Most Americans are the most geographically ignorant people on the face of the planet. Where'd you go on your vacation? Aruba, where's that? I don't know, we flew. Okay, you know what I'm talking about. Well, they realized that when they built this ship. It doesn't matter where the ship goes. The ship itself is the destination. And when you talk to people coming off the ship and say, hey, where'd you go? All they want to tell you about is what they did on the ship. And that works for them. Now, the other new ships that are coming out, you have ships from Silver Sea, like the Silver Nova, and later this year, the Silver Ray. Beautiful, beautiful, brand new luxury cruise ships. And then you have the new Expedition ships. Expedition ships from Seaborne and Silver Sea and National Geographic and MSC. MSC is here today. They have a, a new ship that's already out called the Explorer One. Anybody know about it? You do, it's a great ship. But what's cool about these expedition ships is they're going to ports that nobody else is going to. You're not gonna be stuck in St. Thomas with seven other ships. By the way, if you wanna to go to St. Thomas, you better do your homework and find out from your travel agent or whoever's booking your cruise, tell me the one day that this ship is gonna be in port where there are no other ships. That's the cruise you want. Because otherwise the infrastructure gets taxed. And I'll talk about that in a second. But the cool thing about these expedition ships is they've combined adventure with luxury and ports you never knew about. If we go back to the original days of the love boat, which I know some of you might remember that, you know how many ports of call there were in the cruise industry? About seven. Let me name them for you. Nassau, 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 Bermuda, and Nassau. That was it. And the guest star every week was Charo. <laughs> how many people remember Charo? Help us out. Don't raise your hand, it's too embarrassing. Don't. But, you know how many ports of call there are today? Everyone want to guess? Over 1,200. There are ports of call out there today that are amazing, and what the cruise lines are doing that are smart, and you can ask them here if they're doing it, because most of them are, and they rearrange their schedules to benefit you, not the port. What is less exciting than getting into a port at seven in the morning and leaving at four in the afternoon, right? Crazy. You're racing on a tour bus, you're grabbing one pina colada, a straw hat and a t-shirt and wondering what the hell happened. You did that, didn't you? Uh, okay. But what they're doing now, and St. Thomas is a good example, like the name of the ship I just gave you before, the Explorer One, they're showing up when the other ships leave and they're overnighting and they're giving you an opportunity for a deeper immersion into a city, a state, a destination, and a culture that you otherwise would never have. Because when you think about it, of all the benefits of cruising, right? You don't have to pack and unpack and you get many different places on your itinerary. It's really the appetizer. It's really the opportunity for you to say, oh, I like that, I wanna come back. So if you don't like it because of all the stuff that just happened to you at seven in the morning to four in the afternoon, you're not coming back. But the problem of over-tourism, which was topic A back in you know, February and March of 2020, is topic A again today. Take a look at Athens. Last summer, 30,000 people a day in 100 degree plus weather were struggling to get up to the Acropolis. Many of them were passing out. So how did the Greece government figure out how to deal with that? 
They said, oh, we're going to change that now. We're only going to let 20,000 up. <laughs> That's not solving anything. We have a problem right now even in Barcelona. We have a problem in Venice. The bridge of size is the bridge of thighs with all their selfie sticks. Venice is now charging you a, a fee of about five euros a day if you can't prove that you have a reservation at a hotel there. They're trying to get rid of all the day trippers. Is that gonna make a difference? No, the people pay the $5 and they'll still crowd on the bridge of size. It's a, it's a joke, right? In Las Vegas, they just passed a new rule. City Fathers, you're gonna love this. You can be liable to a fine of $1,000 or a jail sentence if you stop on a bridge overlooking the strip to take a selfie. If the, the way the law is now worded, if you stop and impede anybody else from moving because you stopped, you're arrested. So what happens in Vegas, <laughs> well, you know what. So how do we solve these problems? You can't expect governments to do it. You solve it. Get rid of the words on season and embrace the words off season. Nobody's going to Paris for a suntan. You don't have to go to Venice in July and August. It, by the way, that's when Venice smells. How many people have been to Venice in July or August? Do you agree with me? Okay. So figure out a contrarian way to see the world, right? There are benefits of going to Alaska in February and Palm Springs in August. I've been to both, I've been in those seasons. It works. You adjust your schedule and guess what? No lines, no crowds, better service, less fares, and you get to experience the culture in a way it was designed to be, to be experienced. You need to do that. And if you don't do that, then don't look for me to, to you know, come, come crying to me when you collapse on the way to the Acropolis in July. Doesn't work. Remember, there are 196 countries in the world. Now, I've been to 152 of them. There are 44 I never get to. I don't look at it as a race. And I laugh all the time when people tell me, oh, I've been to every country in the world. And my one question then back was, how? Well, how did you do it? Well, I waited for the ship to get to the island. I jumped off, I touched it, and I went back on. You didn't go. You didn't do anything. It's not a race. It's not a race. How many of you have a passport? I asked this question when we were with Phil before. Not enough. How many people need one? <laughs> Nobody raised their hand. You know who I'm talking about. A passport is the best document you'll ever have. It gives you freedom, it gives you options, it's good for 10 years, it's the, it's the most inexpensive investment you'll ever make. For those of you who don't have a passport, get one now because last year the wait time for a new or renewal passport was between 16 and 18 weeks. There goes your summer. It's already beginning of February just about. If you don't do it now, there goes your summer. Get out there and do it. And if you're gonna do it, get the page, get the 52 pager, not the 28 pager. It doesn't cost you any more. The reason is passports last officially for 10 years. But if you run out of pages, in the old days, they used to put new pages in at the consulate. Now they don't, you have to get a new passport, even if you've only had it for three years. That's number one. Some good news, visas. Some countries have finally embraced the notion that a visa is a barrier to travel. Not an entry to travel, a barrier. So in the last month, two countries decided to go visa-free. One is Kenya, and the other is Turkey. That's a big deal. It's not a source of income from them, but it was, it was just a source of annoyance. Now you can just get it. And a lot of other countries are getting smart and they're doing something called visa on arrival. So you don't have to go to some consulate or some passport service. Just when you get there, boom, they stamp it. And most of them now aren't even stamping them. In fact, some of them are getting smart enough to realize that the worst first impression they could ever make is called immigration and passport control. How many people went to Lisbon last year? Anybody? Did you like the lines? The lines were up to four hours just to get your passport stamped. There were 18 different inspection stations at the Lisbon airport and two people working. Now they all have airline schedules there in Lisbon. They know what time the planes come in. They all come in between six and nine in the morning because of all the overnight flights from the US. And it was horrendous. Now they finally got smart. They got smart because the transport minister who controlled the customs and immigration guys wasn't talking to the tourism minister and realizing they were 
annoying everybody. They finally figured that out. In London, where the lines used to be ridiculously long, they've now gone to E-Gates. Has anybody tried the E-Gates yet? How cool are they? The best, right? You were probably in shock that you were allowed in because it, so, it went so fast, right? I mean, nothing personal on you, but... So we're getting smart. How many people here have global entry? Is that or is that not the best US government program ever, right? Who wants to spend 11 hours on a flight and two hours at immigration? Right now, they've even improved it now. You don't have to use your, your, your fingerprints. You don't have to use the, the, the palm prints. They don't have to do the passport. You just look at the camera, it's all biometric, and it goes done, and the customs agent goes, hi, Peter. I'm like, he knows my name, right? It's smart. This is technology that works, and it's technology that helps you. Here is the technology that doesn't help you. How many of you, and I know I happen to see a lot of hands go up, make your reservations online? Okay, you are all losers. Now, would you like to know why you're losers? If you don't wanna know why you're losers, you're really losers. Do you wanna know why you're losers? Thank you, losers. Okay, here we go. What you're seeing on your screen is not all the inventory. What you're seeing on your screen is not all the available flights or all the available hotel rooms. It's only what that online travel agency wants to show you. How many of you go online to see only three seats left or only two rooms left? Total lie. All that means is they may only have two seats left in the inventory allocation they got from the travel provider. How many of you have gone onto the website of the airline itself after you went on the online situation? Good, then you see the difference. By the way, that applies to fares, that applies to seats, and that applies to schedule. How many people here are confused by code sharing? How many people know what code sharing is? Okay, not enough. The other day, I was flying uh, from Los Angeles to New York, and it was on, a, on an American Airlines flight. It was listed as seven different airlines, right? It was American, uh, uh, Royal Jordanian, British, Finnair, uh, and uh, Cutter, and I forgot two more. But if you were making a reservation, how would you know what terminal it was leaving from, right? So, but forgetting that confusion, and by the way, let me help you. Anytime you're making a reservation on a flight and that flight has four digits, not three, two, or one, if it has four, that means it's a code share flight not operated by the airline you thought was operating it. So the, the American Airlines flight that I was on had three digits, but British Airlines on the same plane had four. But how do you get through all that to know you're gonna get, get the best fare? Because what code sharing really means is that each of those airlines is given a certain amount of inventory on that one plane, but they price it differently. And the difference could be as much as $700 for the same seat on the same flight operated by one airline. So if you see a code share flight, the very first thing you wanna do is go on all the other websites of all the other airlines to see what they've got. But that's not the old answer because the internet can't always be your friend. It can't answer your questions, right? What you need to do is to, before you ever book it, get on the phone and have a conversation with that air carrier, the direct air carrier, to find out, A, if that's really the flight that's going, if you can really get the seat you want, because for those of you who go shopping online, they want to continue you for everything, right? They want to charge you extra for an upsell for a seat. Premium economy means you have less of a chance of orthopedic surgery. Right, they're jamming so many uh, seats on the plane, it's impossible. How, by the way, speaking of so many seats on the plane, how many people saw the video of the Japan Airlines crash in Haneda on the, of the Japanese Coast Guard plane that it hit? So I'm gonna give you the good news first. That was a triple set, excuse me, it was an A350 Japan Airlines plane where the Japanese Coast Guard plane did not listen to the instructions of the tower and they turned onto an active runway and the JAL flight hit them. And of course, that plane was then consumed in flames. Here's the good news. Everybody got out. Everybody got out. Now I'm gonna tell you why. Every year, every US airline has to comply with an FAA regulation that they can evacuate a fully loaded plane with half the exits blocked in the dark in less than 90 seconds. And every year, the airlines pass the test. 
I finally figured out a couple of years ago how they did it. They hired cash from Cirque du Soleil. <laughs> Seriously. And that's in a situation where half the exits are blocked and it's in the dark. If none of the exits were blocked and it was fully lit, you couldn't get out in less than 10 minutes. Why? Because Americans like leaving with their carry-on. Americans like leaving with their shoes. Americans like leaving with their backpacks, their dogs, their emotional support animals. And I say it just like that. Because we all know that they're not really emotional support animals. We did a piece on CBS a couple of years ago to prove the point of how much of a fraud it was. We went to a farm in Pennsylvania and I rented a pig. I got the pig signed up as my emotional support animal. We got its little red vest. And we did a segment on CBS called When Pigs Fly. You knew that was coming. In any case, how did those folks get off that plane with nobody being injured on a plane that was consumed by flames with half the exits blocked and in the dark? Are you ready? They're Japanese. They listen to instructions. They behave. They listen to the flight attendants. They were perfect passengers. Americans? But I wanted to take my hand and the hand and, I, and then they die. Well, here's the bigger problem. It goes back to the FAA. Because what did the FAA do allowing the airlines to do about four years ago? They allowed the airlines to complete that test on computer. Are you nuts? Doesn't make any difference. But it's worse because if you haven't noticed anything, airlines have been jamming more seats on those planes, as many as they can possibly do. By the way, speaking of the 737 MAX, that's a fuselage they can't stretch anymore, and they can't add another seat in there, it's so crowded. Has anybody here flown on a MAX? Okay, did you attempt to go to the bathroom? Did you see the size of the bathroom? Wait, I challenge any of you to go in that bathroom, close the door, and wash both hands in the sink at the same time. It's physically impossible. That's how small it is, right? Except for the cast of Cirque du Soleil. Now, the problem with adding all those extra seats is it makes your, your odds of, of evacuating a plane even harder. Even harder. I timed the other day. I was on a 737 MAX. I was landing in Atlanta, and I was sitting on like row 23. And so from the moment the gate was open and the door was open for people to evacuate, not evacuate, leave the plane on a normal flight, I turned on my stopwatch. How long did it take people to leave? To empty, to, by the time they got to me, not a, just when they got to my row, 14 minutes. So that brings up another thing for those of you who book online. Believe it or not, the airlines think that a legal connection time is as little as 33 minutes. A lot of us connect flights. A 33 minute connect time is suicidal. You can't do it. And with every plane being full, if you miss that connecting flight, even if the airline wants to put you on their next flight, that plane's full. How many people have been to the Charlotte airport? Did you notice those cute white rocking chairs? Weren't they, weren't they fun, cute, special? They're giving you a message. You're gonna be here a while. So when you go online, what are you motivated by? Rates. You want the cheapest rate, right? Only three seats left, oh, I better hit the keystroke. If you see any kind of connecting time, less than two and a half hours, don't do it. There are airlines in this country that have never learned the words on time. Do you understand that? So why would you do that to yourself? A 33 minute connect time is ridiculous. Here's something else they don't tell you. How many people have gone to London? How many people have connected in London? All right, do you know what the legal connect time is at Heathrow Airport for passengers? Three hours. Here's what they won't tell you. What's the legal connect time for your bags? <laughs> Four. Now I failed math in high school, but that part I can handle. So why would you give yourself a three hour connect time? You better give yourself four. This is what the internet does not tell you. And by the way, it doesn't just apply to airlines, it applies to hotels, right? How many people here are affected by rates? You wanna get, if the rate changes $5, everybody moves without regard to asking certain questions that they can't get answered on the internet anyway, right? Same thing, only three rooms left, garbage, but it's worse. How many people here love the dreaded resort fees? 
Did I see somebody raise their hand? You raised your hand? Okay, we have to talk. What is a resort fee? It's no different than what discount airlines do with low airfares. Why do you think Frontier Airlines will offer you a ticket for $20? Because airline tickets are taxed at a very high federal excise tax rate. So if they charge you, for example, $100 for the ticket, they made only net 42 of those dollars. The rest goes to tax. So if they charge you $20 for the ticket, but $100 to breathe, that's a fee, not a fare. And they only get taxed at the, sales, at the state sales tax rate, which means they net 93 of those $100 as opposed to the fare. So it's a tax dodge. The same thing happens with resort fees. Every hotel in the world, right here in New York as well, municipal occupancy taxes that could be as high as 23%. So at 23% on a $200 a night room means the hotel automatically doesn't get $46 a night. Right, that goes right to the city. So, here comes that resort fee, which many hotels do what? They don't disclose when you make the reservation. They don't disclose when you check in, but then you get your bill. That is called failure to disclose and lack of transparency. That's a federal offense. We've gone after many of them on my show. There have been a couple of state attorneys general that went after them as well, based on a lot of the stuff we've written. And now there's some settlements out there with major hotel chains. Marriott is one of them. And what does the settlement say? They now have to display that resort fee in the same typeface, font, and position as the room rate itself. But wait a minute, does that mean you have to pay it? It does not. Everything in a hotel is negotiable. Hotels do not make money when you just check in and stay once. Hotels make money when you check in, have a good time, and tell all your friends and come back. The resort fee is the conversation killer. You'll see people at checkout going, what? Right? Many of you have had that happen. All these other charges that they don't disclose are things that you can fight back on. It's called failure to disclose. If you don't receive a service or a good that you contracted for on your credit card, I'm presuming you're paying with your credit card, you can dispute the charge. I've never had a resort fee levied where I didn't dispute it and I had it taken off. And it's not because I'm on CBS. I just realized it's negotiable. I was at the hotel in San Juan by the way, we named names here, it was the Sheridan. And when I checked in, they gave me my coupon for my free welcome drink. I don't drink. So I said, well, what is this part of? Oh, that's our resort fee. I said, what's the resort fee? It's $45 a night. I said, I'm gonna be here four nights. So you're telling me this cocktail just cost me $180? Oh no, you get other things. Really, what do I get? A free yoga lesson. So I said, let me tell you what's gonna to happen tomorrow. I'm gonna to be in the middle of downward dog saying and meditating on what the hell am I paying $180 for? They removed the charge. You have the ability to do that. You vote with your wallet. You'll see on some websites, especially in cities like Las Vegas, the words mandatory resort fee. It's still negotiable. You get nothing for it. It's like the joke of the guy checking out of the hotel and he's charged the resort fee and he says to the general, he's with his wife, and he says to the general manager, what is this? Oh, it's our resort fee. We have, you know, you, you got a free towel at the pool and you get a free beach chair and we have a gym, but you chose not to use it. And we also have a free exercise room, but you chose not to use it. And we have, the, and he said, well, uh, let me see the bill. And he takes the bill and he gives him a check for $20. He says, well, what's that? He said, well, my wife was with me and you could have slept with her, but you chose not to do it. Okay, the point is you have negotiating room here and you should use it because let's face it, we need truth out there when we travel. Now, I do not deny any hotel or airline the opportunity to make a profit. We need more of them out there to create more competition to have a better marketplace. What I dispute and what I go after is when they try to do stuff without fully disclosing it or explaining it. I'm the kind of guy that got thrown out of almost every school I went to because if somebody told me the speed limit is 65 miles an hour and I would say why, and they told me, well, you know, we've done our research and at 66 miles an hour, you're gonna die a fiery death. My answer is, thank you for telling me, I'll drive 55. But if I asked why the speed limit was 65 and their answer was because, or it's our policy, I'm driving 80 because you didn't make your case. 
it's up to you as responsible travelers to make the travel industry make their case. And if they do make their case, go with it. The other thing you need to do is this, have a conversation. Those of you who book online are victims waiting to happen because you didn't have a conversation with somebody who is empowered to do what? Give you a yes. The rule is you never want to take a no from somebody who's not empowered to give you a yes in the first place. Right? That applies to everything you do online, including travel insurance. How many people who book online know about what I'm about to tell you? That is, you can't complete the transaction unless you either opt in or opt out of the insurance. And you have no idea what you're covered for. And worse, you have no idea what you're not covered for. Right? But then you think, oh, I, I want peace of mind. So I'm gonna hit that little keystroke and, and you just bought worthless insurance. We discovered that during the pandemic because nobody got to page five of that insurance company website where they had a paragraph that said, oh, by the way, we don't cover for pandemic, Bye bye So you, you bought worthless insurance. Also, there are so many different exclusions in every policy that you need to be aware of to find out whether it even applies to you. There are age uh, exclusions, pre-existing medical exclusions, destination exclusions. If you're, thinking, if you're thinking of going to the Gaza Strip right now, you might not be insured. Right? But people don't think about that. They think it's blanket coverage and they'll be covered. Now that's what's called trip cancellation and interruption insurance. That's what you see on the websites. Don't buy it on those websites. You can buy it from a travel agent. You can actually have a conversation with a travel agent who can walk through you the hieroglyphics of that policy so you know what you're covered for and what you're not covered for. But we're not done yet with insurance because some of the insurance policies right now to their credit or companies have gotten better. For example, they're changing some of the age exclusions. They're changing some of the destination exclusions and they've changed the pandemic exclusions. So many of those policies now will cover pandemic. Now, COVID's still with us. We may not be in a pandemic, but people are still getting COVID, you need that insurance. But there's another kind of insurance you need. And some of you may already have it. It's called trip cancellation and interruption insurance. Who has that? It's called medical evacuation and repatriation insurance. Who has that? Okay. Now, let me tell you what it means in principle and in theory, and then let's go through it. And by the way, I have it. I've had it for 25 years, and I'll uh, knock on wood that I've never had to use it, but I know friends of mine who did, and they swear by it. Here's what it means in principle, that if you get sick or injured anywhere overseas, that insurance, if the policy language is correct, will first of all pay to get you medically stabilized where you are, then they'll consult with your personal doctor. After all, who knows your medical history better than your own personal physician? And then after that consultation, depending on your condition, they will fly a medically equipped jet to fly you to the medical facility of your choice and the doctor of your choice. That's the way the language should read. Now, not every policy has that language. Once again, it requires a conversation because some of those policies say they'll fly you to the medical facility and doctor of their choice and you end up in a bad HMO in Hoboken, this is not what you had in mind. So, you need to get that kind of coverage and you need to do it on the phone in a conversation with a travel professional. We saw a case in Egypt with a stupid American tourist who decided one day he wanted to climb the pyramids in Giza. Anybody who's been to Giza knows those pyramids are not steps, they're mountains, <laughs> right? I have no idea how they built it. How many people died just building it? Of course, he slipped and fell, broke his hip, he did not have the medical evacuation or repatriation insurance. He had to buy four first class seats for them to put the stretcher on lengthwise. He had to buy a fifth first class seat for the nurse that was required to go with him. His airfare costs alone were $87,000. Now medical evacuation and repatriation insurance, they have an annual policy of about $600. They have family plans. You can even buy it per trip, but guys, do yourself a favor, buy it, but not without having a conversation, and never buy it online. Now, my favorite topic. I know we're going to see some hands here. How many of you are members of a frequent flyer program? How many members of more than one? Thank you for your loyalty. <laughs> okay. Do you know how many individual frequent flyer accounts there are in this country among the three major airlines, American, United, and Delta? Anybody want to guess? 354 million. That's more than the number of people who live in America. Now, how many of you have mileage 
that you haven't been able to redeem. Now I'm going to tell you something even crazier. How many miles are there out there now that have been earned by you, by me, by everybody else that not only have not been able to be redeemed, but will never be redeemed? Take a guess. Who, who said a billion? A billion? Billions. Okay, you are not going to the showcase showdown. It's 34 trillion. Think about that. We're all mileage addicts. We want to get miles for everything short of breathing. And then we can't redeem it. First of all, either all the planes are full or they don't want to release those seats because they don't want to displace revenue passengers. They made a promise to you that they had no intention of keeping. If I said to you, give me all your money, put it in my account, and you have a 7% chance of getting it back, would you do it? Yeah, but you did it with the frequent flyer programs because the average redemption level is about 7%. And yet, we get bonus membership offers all the time for credit cards, 70,000 miles, 100,000 miles, and we all go, ooh, that's great. And we all signed, by the way, during the pandemic, you know how many Americans signed up for those bonus cards? A lot. And you know what the interest rate is on those cards? It starts at 24%, and the banks are allowed to go up to 35%. The average is 26% interest. And if you don't pay it on time, your free ticket just costs you $5,000, right? By the way, consumer credit card spending is at an all-time high right now, and so is consumer credit card debt. Consumer credit card debt right now in this country is $1.4 trillion. That's unsecured credit. So this brings me to my next item up for bids here on The Price is Right. How many people here in the audience have a credit card actually affiliated with a particular airline mileage program? My advice to you is burn it. Because you're paying high interest, chasing miles you can't redeem, and if you don't pay your bill on time, you'll never get ahead of it. Uh, same applies to American Express, by the way, for another reason. How many people here are members of the Delta Airlines frequent flyer program? How many people here were thrilled by the changes they announced? Anybody? Okay. If anybody raised their hands, that would be they are an employee of Delta. The problem right now is, what have the airlines done? They've changed what was a loyalty program. For those of us who remember, that started in 1981. They changed the loyalty program to a privilege program. And it's not about how many miles you fly or how many flights you take. It's about how much money you spend. It's out of control. If you want the lowest tier membership status in the Delta Frequent Flyer program, you now have to spend a minimum of $75,000 a year on their credit card, their American Express credit card. And you know what the lowest tier of their program gets you? Here, I can show it to you. That's it. And even if you have the highest tier, there's no chance you're gonna get the upgrade because the planes are full. So why are you in the program, right? Let me give you an example. I had to fly recently between Nashville and Orlando. That's a flight, if you go nonstop, of an hour and 18 minutes. America and United and Delta don't fly that nonstop. Delta flies it through Atlanta, American flies it through Charlotte with the little white rocking chairs, and United flies it through Houston. The airfare on coach, one way, was $439, okay? Now, there is an airline that flies it nonstop, and an airline that most of you would say, I'm not flying that airline. Well, I flew it. One hour and 18 minutes nonstop with an airfare of $67. It was, come on, you know it, Spirit, there you go. Spirit, the airline's motto is, we're not happy until you're not happy, I know. But the seats didn't recline. Who cares? It was an hour and 18 minute flight. They didn't serve food on the flight. Airline flew is an oxymoron anyway. Forget that. The plane was brand new. We got there on time. Had I flown the Delta flight that day, I would have, got, I would have spent $437 or $39. I would have gotten mileage I couldn't use and a Biscoff cookie. How many people like the Biscoff cookies? You know you do. Okay. But by saving over $370 on Spirit, my value proposition was I could go out and buy 128 cases of Biscoff cookies. That's tangible, which brings me back to the credit cards that are affiliated with the airlines. Those credit cards are costing you too much money. 
The people who are getting smart are doing cash back cards. Or they're doing cards that give you points that actually buy you tickets. So that could be the Chase Sapphire Reserve, that could be Venture X on Capital One, many of the, the Discover card, many other cards do that. It, it's a tangible asset for you. It gives you money back, right? For those people who have the American Express card, that was tied to Delta. And one of the reasons why you joined the American Express program was you got access to the lounge, Mr. Piper. <laughs> you got access to the lounge. Well, they gave away so many of those cards and they sold so many of them, you can't get into the Delta Lounge. You see big lines at six o'clock in the morning at LaGuardia with people waiting to get in for bad hummus. Has anybody ever had good hummus at an airline lounge? I rest my case. Okay, but the point is, what's the point of membership if you can't use it? So what you need to do is reevaluate your own financial situation, but, ex but at least explore the idea of a cashback card because the mileage programs are essentially after 43 years, remember they started in 1981, after 43 years, they're not delivering the promise they made. And since there's no regulation anymore, it's deregulation, there's nobody watching the store and there's nobody telling the airlines they have to keep the promise. Now we may see some changes soon because when Delta made those changes back in October, they angered so many people, that include, so many of their members, and who was a member? Judges, lawyers, members of Congress, all of whom are going, what? So get ready to see some of that happen, but you can beat the gun by, by reassessing at least the cards you have in your wallet. Because if you think you're just gonna continue to accrue miles that continue to be devalued by the airline, I'll give you one more figure that should surprise you. Last summer, and by the way, I have 23 million miles. And I can stand up here and brag all day, but I'm in the same boat you are. What's the point of having the miles if I can't redeem them? I have hundreds of plus points on United Airlines. By the way, today's January 27th. They expire in four days. They go away. I've never been able to use them, right? Last summer, I wanted to go from New York to Copenhagen. We were doing a show there, and I have all these miles on Delta. I have miles on everybody, right? I still have my Biscoff cookies. And so I called Delta and I said, are there any mileage tickets available in coach? between New York and Copenhagen. They fly it nonstop. No. All right, how about Economy Plus? Right, that, that's where the orthopedic surgeon gets you off the plane. No. How about business? No. They had one seat available for mileage. Now before I tell you what they wanted the mileage for, let me tell you one other figure. 54% of all mileage earned, that you earn, is earned on the ground with those credit cards. So if they were gonna give you a 25,000 mile award, that means you would have had to what? Spend $14,000 to get it, not counting the 11,000 miles you flew to get to the 25,000 miles and that free ticket that may only retail for $350. Okay, hold on to that 54% figure. Who wants to tell me how many miles they wanted for one round trip ticket between New York and Copenhagen? How many gates? How much? 225,000? Okay, you have to join him with a billion. No, no, anybody wanna guess? 750,000 miles. Now, remember that 54% figure I gave you? If I had been stupid enough to redeem 750,000 miles for that ticket, that meant I would have spent $405,000 for a round trip ticket to Copenhagen. For $405,000, I could have chartered four Gulfstream jets and taken all of them. Well, not all of them, 30 of my closest friends. You get the point of the value proposition. Where's the value in the mileage programs now? It's essentially disappearing. So you need to protect yourself with a points card or a cash back card to help you out. Now in the little bit of time I have left, I'm gonna tell you about three shows I'd love you to watch. They're all on PBS, Amazon, and Apple. Uh, one is called The Royal Tour, which you've been doing for 23 years now. It's where I go to individual heads of state. It's an impossible show because I get them to give me eight days of their schedule devoted only to me. And then for the next eight days, that king, president, or prime minister is my personal tour guide to and through that country. They have no right of editorial review or control. Whatever happens, happens. Imagine two people on a road trip, one of whom just happens to run the country. We've done it with everybody from the King of Jordan, the president of Mexico, the prime minister of New Zealand. We did it with Netanyahu in earlier years. We did it in Peru and Ecuador and Jamaica, most recently in Poland, Rwanda, and what's on the air right now is the president of Tanzania. 
So I hope you get a chance to watch it. If you can't see it on PBS, it's on Amazon Prime and Apple TV+. Plus. Our second show is called Hidden, and the concept there is no gift shop, no tour bus, no guidebook, no brochure, no TripAdvisor stickers. We're going to take you to the most amazing experiences in a destination that nobody knows about, but that are totally accessible to you. And then our third show, which is now going into season nine, is called The Travel Detective. That's our weekly news magazine and investigator show dealing with stories like we've been talking about today, the process of travel and how you can become better travelers. So I hope you get a chance to watch that. Our newsletter, not transactional law, we sell nothing. It's easy, you can sign up for free. It's got the most amazing website name, petergreenberg.com. I think you'll remember that. But again, we're not selling anything. We're updating it every week. And of course, you can follow me on all the, on all the online platforms, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, X, whatever X is these days. We're all out there. Now, in the meantime, who's got some questions? We've got microphones over.